uh, victims of human trafficking to those that we serve. Our mission is to bring an end to domestic violence and sexual assault in partnership with the community. And we do that through um, partnerships and fundraising and engaging people in bringing an end to the problem. And I guess I'm the one at the top with the vision, or so they tell me. Because you're the executive director. Exactly. That's, that's allegedly my job. <laughs> you weren't one of the founding members. No, our founders were um, three Latino women. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting all of them. And they started as victims who wanted to make sure that other women did not have to go through what they went through. So they, they created We've founded it, and fair, fairly shortly after that, turned it over to another executive director who was here for quite a long time. I worked for her in the, in the 90s, as a matter of fact. One of our biggest challenges in Sacramento, which is a very diverse community, is that there are some subjects that are absolutely taboo, especially in, um, with Latino families. And sexual assault is one of them, and domestic violence is the other. So encouraging those victims to come forward and get the help that they need is very, very challenging for us as an agency, and it's something that we actually have prioritized this year. We've been working with the Mex Mexican consulate and a lot of other supportive services in the region, just trying to encourage victims to get the help that they need because we, we know there's a big problem there. What can we as a American society, the United States society, what can we do about it? And one of the biggest challenges we have in serving monolingual Spanish-speaking clients, which we have many of, is finding the service providers who can do it. Finding bilingual counselors is a big challenge for us. People who've, who've got that education and the experience um, is, is very tough. And also just finding those, um, those linkages to, to that community, people that are trusted who will send their folks our way, knowing that we will serve them well. So one of our viewers is like you or I, is an Anglo-American, maybe they don't speak Spanish. What can they do for you other than writing you a check? You know, I think that any of us, especially if we're educated, we aren't a person of color, um, we don't have some of those typical things that you think of as being barriers to success in our background, we have to own the fact that we have a a level of privilege and responsibility to offer assistance and go an extra mile, go beyond just being available for service and actually look for people who need our help and help connect them to resources. What we try to train people to do is to recognize and respond when they see somebody who might need help. And there are certain people who have more access to folks who might need help. Hairdressers hear a lot of stories. We do a lot of trainings with hairdressers. Anybody in the medical field has a unique relationship sure. with somebody who might be at risk. Landlords, um, people who, who work in the housing industry are likely to see the signs of domestic violence and human trafficking and sexual assault. It's everybody keeping their ears and eyes open and, and just noticing. If somebody's being mean to somebody in a grocery store, not just letting that happen in front of you, actually saying something to someone. You've said twice human trafficking. How common is that in the United States? You know, I did not believe that there was a human trafficking problem three years ago when we were first approached to be a part of a collaborative. And I said, if there's funding, I want the funding up front because I don't know if there are any people and if we're gonna develop an infrastructure here to help them, we need the money. Um, Sacramento is one of the key hotbeds in Northern California for human trafficking along with- Why Con do you think that is? You know, it's Contra Costa County and Alameda County, and the traffickers are moving the people around. We're at the crossroads of I-80 and I-5. Um, there's huge access to people and the ability to move them around. So we're, we're seeing more and more victims, um, and they really fall into two different categories. There's the underage sex traffic minors is a completely different issue than international victims of trafficking who are lured to the United States with hopes of work and a new life and then are held captive. They're really two different populations and we serve them both. And Las Vegas and Sacramento are very similar sized cities. Las Vegas is just slight, slightly larger. And he, he was saying that it's very common and that, and that people, the same kind of people who go to Vegas, you know, 
to roll that dice one more time, you know, maybe literally and figuratively roll the dice, are the kind of people who might want to hire an enslaved person to gratify themselves. Is that, I mean, is there that same kind of dynamic here? Sacramento's a bedroom community with a bunch of government workers. You know, with the internet nowadays, people have a unique access to whatever it is they want to buy. And unfortunately, too often that's underage minors and who are being trafficked. And so, yeah, it's a huge problem. And it's getting harder and harder to stop because every time we figure out where they're, they're peddling these poor kids, they find another way around it. And the kids deny it, and they often are being arrested for prostitution, and we're never getting to the pimps. We're never getting to the people who are actually doing the trafficking. Well, and when we punish the victims, whether it's a victim who is an undocumented immigrant or a victim of human trafficking, we never get to the real perpetrators of the crime, first of all, and we create these multi-layers of barriers for anyone to ever seek help. They're afraid to even look for help because they might get shipped somewhere, they arrested. Might get deported. Absolutely. So it becomes extra hard to try to serve the people that we're trying to serve um, because we're just one more, one more scary thing out there that isn't going to help them. One of our viewers is somebody I went to high school with. Okay, their grandparents were Americans. Why should they care what happens to these people? So many people misunderstand the whole dynamic of domestic violence and sexual assault. I think it's not happening to them or their friends. People are astounded when they learn that the neighbor down the street, a friend of a friend, somebody they go to church with has been a victim and is just has not been empowered to get the help or to speak out. So, you know, on the one hand, we've got just anybody in the community who might have been affected by this, you know, filtering down to the neediest of the needy who have zero resources. If we don't care about everybody and try to help them, nobody gets helped. And we shove it under the carpet and it, these become issues that nobody talks about and they damage our society. A third of American women could expect to be raped in their life. Do you think that that's still an accurate number? And what about men? The study just came out and it was one in four women and one in six men have been sexually assaulted in their lifetime. I mean, that's a big that's chunk a of our of population. It's a ton of people. And when you think that three quarters of those sexual assaults are by someone that the victim knows, these aren't strangers jumping out of bushes, they're people that are known and trusted and are part of our society and part of that person's life. Otherwise, they couldn't get access to you. I mean, think of the damage that it's doing to young people you know, that, who are at the most risk. Not that sexual assault doesn't happen to everybody, but you know, we're really looking at that teenage through 25-year-old group of people in our community who are in tremendous risk of being sexually assaulted. Part of breaking the cycle of violence is educating women about what that cycle looks like so that in the future, if they find themselves in a relationship, they, they see those red flags. They say, oh, he's really controlling, he's very jealous, you know, all of those things that we know are precursors to the violence. So, so half of it's education. It's absolutely educating victims about what, what to watch for. Where does WEAVE get its funding? Our budget this year is $3.2 million. Half of that comes from the state and the county and a, a whole patchwork of federal grants and the rest is raised from the community between um, f actual fundraising and then we have a thrift store that generates funds but also gives a lot of the items away to our clients. What percentage of the half that you raise privately is small donations and what is big donations? You know, I'm, I'm picturing the pie for this Say 250 year. or less. Um, $250 or yeah, less. $250 or less. Um, our online donations and direct mail, which are tend to be those smaller amounts, for this year will be just under $100,000. So it's so not that much. It's not that much. Less. That's 3%. Right. That's 3%. Yeah. It's, it's a small amount.
We depend on corporate grants and big donations. And, and government. And, and our government funding. So that's your primary career traje trajectory is fundraising. I, I actually went into fundraising on purpose. I'm one of the few people I know. And in 92, when we moved to Sacramento, my first job was at the public radio station. And then... Um, is that the one that's out of San Francisco? No. Or the one that's at Cal State Sacramento? Yeah, Cal State Sacramento. It's now a seven or nine network um, radio situation. And then, um, then I was at Weave for six years. And then I went back to the radio station as their director of development and marketing. And I worked in public broadcasting locally and then on a national contract doing fundraising consulting for a year. Wow. So most of my career has been public broadcasting and weave. How is your work inspirational? You know, I spent a lot of time with other people in this field um, and a lot of time, a lot of them sit around and say, there's no money and nothing's changed in 30 years. And I think we, and what we've been doing at Weave is finding new and different ways to deliver services. It's not the same. It doesn't look like it did when I got here in 95 at all. We have, we've changed a lot of what we do and how we approach services to victims. We're engaging more people. We're engaging men, which has been controversial in the field. You know, what, what's the role of men in, in ending violence? Well, I would argue they're the ones who can end the violence. And um, by not embracing them all these years, We've missed out on 50% of the population who actually could could stop this thing. Are you talking about men like me who would want to support your good work, or men like those who might be perpetrating the crime? Two key things that we've been doing all depend on men standing up and setting good examples for other men, and men and boys being willing to step in and call each other on their stuff. Um, one is a program called Coaching Boys into Men, where we train the coaches who then work with the athletes through this standardized program. And at the end of it, we're actually seeing that the athletes are changing their behaviors and their attitudes towards young women and are willing to be peer role models in their school. Um, in April, we will have 500 of Sacramento's finest men wearing high heels and walking a mile in her shoes to spread awareness about sexual assault prevention. I mean, that's powerful stuff when other men see a guy stand up and say, we won't tolerate this anymore. And yes, it will raise some money, but as much as anything else, it raises it's awareness. It's gonna hit the six o'clock news is what it's gonna do. It does hit the six o'clock news. And, it, and somebody who may be contemplating being abusive, our hope is we'll watch that and go, ooh, maybe not so much. Maybe that's a bad idea. But when we don't talk about it, we that's, don't yeah. say anything, we, we give everybody permission to be naughty. What kinds of organizations does major giving help and how do they raise money? They are a consulting firm and that's who I worked with when we were consulting nationally. Um, works almost exclusively with um, public broadcasting stations originally, but now works with all different kinds of nonprofits, helping them raise major gifts, training them and, and helping guide their um, their case statement and their philosophy and their approach to getting to their major donors. And major gift would be five figures? It depends on the organization. I mean, for my, for the clients I had, uh, for, for all of them, the floor was at least $1,000. But for most of them, we were talking about 5,000 and up gifts. So four figures. Yes. Okay. What is first five and what do you do with them? Um, I am a first five commissioner, and so we have been charged with protecting this pot of money that comes from tobacco tax that's distributed throughout the state. Um, every county has its own pot of first five money, and we support programs throughout, throughout Sacramento County um, based on our strategic plan and what our priorities are to protect the um, zero to five population. Yeah, every county decides what it does with its, with its first five money. Um, you know, for us, we prioritize fluoridation and um, immunizations and dental care and that kind of thing. So it, re it depends on the county. Oh, so the county doesn't have to spend it on tobacco prevention. They can spend it on anything for five and unders. Yeah, first five is anything to do with um, making sure kids are healthy, um, better prepared for school, it could school go to readiness. 
it could, so it could go to support um, what's that federal program for kids? Oh, like Head Start. Head Start. Yep. yep. It could so you, Head you could, Start matching money. We we do that to leverage fed, federal money. You gave me a very lengthy list of associations with which you're associated. <laughs> could you pick one or two or three that seem seminal and most important for you and tell us about them and what you do with them? Let's see. Um, I'm on the board of the Sacramento Children's Coalition, and one of the primary things that we do is the children's report card every year where we look at tons of data and what the overall health of our community is for kids and then we make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors um, to just change the way we do business but it also links my organization and me with a lot of other people who are doing good I think I get the most out of organizations where we're all doing our own piece of the of what needs to be done in this world and we're doing we're coming together and sharing that information and and doing it together and trying to change the way our community is responding to things so I that's a meaningful organization for me is there something like that in Sacramento where everybody sits down at the same table well it's it's interesting because we'd have the interagency council to end homelessness and we just as a community um, realized that this the county could no longer deal with this HUD money so they just formed a new nonprofit and a group of 18 of us have been invited to be on their advisory board with that purpose of let's all sit down and let's address the homeless situation coming at it from different angles. I mean domestic violence is one piece of why people become homeless and I'm not so mired in the homelessness issue as some of the other people so the hope is that by bringing me and other people like me that we'll look an at out it of the box different. view. Exactly. That we're looking at it in an innovative way and um, trying to do something different. You know, if there's something good that has come of all of us losing funding, et cetera, it's that there are fewer organizations. I mean, I hate to say it, but we're all having to look at what each other does and say, you know, why are why are there two of us who do this and why are there three of us who merge. do that? I, and I think that's going to be a really good, the mergers and the people making, you know, who have been hanging on by a shoestring who just can't do it anymore, um, going away, maybe good fallout from this in the long run. One of my favorite things ever is how if you're given an ice cube, how do you make it round? Everybody says, oh, you know, you chop the corners off and stuff. You apply no, heat. You just melt the thing and refreeze it. But you know, I mean, that's, to some extent, I wish we could do that as a, as a society. Let's just melt the whole thing down and build it from scratch instead of trying to work in this infrastructure we have sometimes. We, we had to do that to some extent at Weave when we lost about half a million dollars all in one year. I said, we can't, it's not business as usual. We're going to look at everything, nothing is sacred, and we in one day laid off 22 people. Oh my. Yes, it was. Where'd those people land? Well, we created 12 different jobs and some.